Chapter 6 The leading particulars of this narration were all that Augustus communicated to me while we remained near the box. It was not until afterward that he entered fully into all the details. He was apprehensive of being missed, and I was wild with impatience to leave my detested place of confinement. We resolved to make our way at once to the hole in the bulkhead, near which I was to remain for the present, while he went through to recontour. To leave Tiger in the box was what neither of us could endure to think of, yet how to act otherwise was the question. He now seemed to be perfectly quiet, and we could not even distinguish the sound of his breathing upon applying our ears closely to the box. I was convinced that he was dead, and determined to open the door. We found him lying at full length, apparently in a deep stupor, yet still alive. No time was to be lost, yet I could not bring myself to abandon an animal who had now been twice instrumental in saving my life, without some attempt at preserving him. We therefore dragged him along with us as well as we could, although with the greatest difficulty and fatigue, Augustus during part of the time being forced to clamber over the impediments in our way with the huge dog in his arms a feat to which the feebleness of my frame rendered me totally inadequate. At length we succeeded in reaching the hole, when Augustus got through, and Tiger was pushed in afterward. All was found to be safe, and we did not fail to return sincere thanks to God for our deliverance from the imminent danger we had escaped. For the present, it was agreed that I should remain near the opening, through which my companion could readily supply me with a part of his daily provision and where I could have the advantages of breathing an atmosphere comparatively pure. In explanation of some portions of this narrative, wherein I have spoken of the stowage of the brig, and which may appear ambiguous to some of my readers who may have seen a proper or regular stowage, I must here state that the manner in which this most important duty had been performed on board the Grampus was a most shameful piece of neglect on the part of Captain Bernard, who was by no means as careful or as experienced a seaman as the hazardous nature of the service on which he was employed would seem necessarily to demand. A proper stowage cannot be accomplished in a careless manner, and many, most disastrous accidents, even within the limits of my own experience, have risen from neglect or ignorance in this particular. Coasting vessels in the frequent hurry and bustle attendant upon taking in or discharging cargo are the most liable to mishap from the want of a proper attention to stowage. The great point is to allow no possibility of the cargo or ballast shifting position, even in the most violent rollings of the vessel. With this end, great attention must be paid, not only to the bulk taken in, but to the nature of the bulk, and whether there be a full or only a partial cargo. In most kinds of freight, the stowage is accomplished by means of a screw. Thus, in a load of tobacco or flour, the hold is screwed so tightly into the hold of the vessels that the barrels or hogsheads, upon discharging, are found to be completely flattened and take some time to regain their original shape. This screwing, however, is resorted to principally with a view of obtaining more room in the hold, for in a full load of any such commodities as flour or tobacco, there can be no danger of any shifting whatever at least none from the inconvenience can result. There have been instances, indeed, where this method of screwing has resulted in the most lamentable consequences, arising from a cause altogether distinct from the danger attendant upon a shifting cargo. A load of cotton, for example, tightly screwed while in certain conditions, has been known through the expansion of its bulk to rend a vessel asunder at sea. There can be no doubt either that the same result would ensue in the case of tobacco, while undergoing its usual course of fermentation, were it not for the intercises consequent upon the rotundity of the hogsheads. It is when a partial cargo is received that danger is chiefly to be apprehended from shifting, and that precautions should be always taken to guard against such misfortune. Only those who have encountered a violent gale of wind, or rather who have experienced the rolling of a vessel and a sudden calm after the gale, can form an idea of the tremendous force of the plunges, and of the consequent terrible impetus given to all loose articles in the vessel. It is then that the necessity of a cautious stowage, when there is a partial cargo, becomes obvious. When lying to, 
especially with a small bead cell. A vessel which is not properly modeled in the bows is frequently thrown upon her beam ends, this occurring even every 15 or 20 minutes upon average, yet without any serious consequences resulting, provided there be a proper stowage. If this, however, has not been strictly attended to, in the first of these heavy lurches, the whole of the cargo tumbles over to the side of the vessel, which lies upon the water, and, being thus prevented from regaining her equilibrium, as she would otherwise necessarily do, she is certain to fill in a few seconds and go down. It is not too much to say that at least one half of the instances in which vessels have foundered in heavy gales at sea may be attributed to a shifting cargo or of ballast. When a partial cargo of any kind is taken on board, the hull, after being first stowed as compactly as may be, should be covered with a layer of stout shifting boards, extending completely across the vessel. Upon these boards, strong temporary stanchions should be erected, reaching to the timbers above, and thus securing everything in its place. In cargoes consisting of grain, or any similar matter, additional precautions are requisite. A hold filled entirely with grain upon leaving port will be found not more than three-fourths full upon reaching its destination. This too, although the freight, when measured bushel by bushel by the consignee, will overrun by a vast deal, on account of the swelling of the grain, the quality consigned. This result is occasioned by settling during the voyage, and is the more perceptible in proportion to the roughness of the weather experienced. If grain loosely thrown in a vessel, then, is ever so well secured by shifting boards and stanchions, it will be liable to shift in a very long passage, so greatly as to bring about the most distressing calamities. To prevent these, every method should be employed before leaving port to settle the cargo as much as possible, and for this there are many contrivances, among which may be mentioned the driving of wedges into the grain. Even after all this is done, and usual pains taken to secure the shifting boards, no seaman who knows what he is about will feel altogether secure in a gale of any violence with a cargo of grain on board, and, least of all, with a partial cargo. Yet there are hundreds of our coasting vessels, and, it is likely, many more from the ports of Europe, which sail daily with partial cargoes, even of the most dangerous species, and without any precaution whatever. The wonder is that no more accidents occur than do actually happen. A lamentable instance of this heedlessness occurred to my knowledge in the case of Captain Joel Rice, of the schooner Firefly, which sailed from Richmond, Virginia to Maderia, with a cargo of corn, in the year 1825. The captain had gone many voyages without serious accident, although he was in the habit of paying no attention whatever to his stowage, more than to secure it in the ordinary manner. He had never before sailed with a cargo of grain, and on this occasion had the corn thrown on board loosely, when it did not much more than half fill the vessel. For the first portion of the voyage, he met with nothing more than light breezes. But, when within a day's sail of Madeira, there came on a strong gale from the north-northeast, which forced him to lie to. He brought the schooner to the wind under a double-reefed foresail alone, when she rowed as well as any vessel could be expected to do, and shipped not a drop of water. Toward the night, the gale somewhat abated, and she rolled with more unsteadiness than before, but still did very well until a heavy lurch threw her upon her beam ends to starboard. The corn was then heard to shift bodily, the force and the movement bursting open the main hatchway. The vessel went down like a shot. This happened within hail of a small sloop from Madeira, which picked up one of the crew, the only person saved, and which rode out the gale in perfect security, as indeed a jolly boat might have done under proper management. The stowage on board the Grampus was most clumsily done, if stowage that could be called which was little better than a promiscuous huddling together of oil casks and ship furniture. I have already spoken of the condition of articles in the hold. On the oilop deck there was space enough for my body, as I have stated, between the oil casks and the upper deck. A space was left open around the main hatchway, and several other large spaces were left in the stowage. Near the hole cut through the bulkhead by Augustus, there was room enough for an entire cask, and in this place 
I found myself comfortably situated for the present. By the time my friend had got safely into the berth, and readjusted his handcuffs and to the rope, it was broad daylight. We had made a narrow escape indeed, for scarcely had he arranged all matters when the mate came below with Dirk Peters and the cook. They talked for some time about the vessel from the Cape Verdes, and seemed to be excessively anxious for her appearance. At length, the cook came to the berth in which Augustus was lying, and seated himself in it near the head. I could see and hear everything from my hiding place, for the piece cut out had not been put back, and I was in momentary expectation that the negro would fall against the pea jacket, which was hung up to conceal the aperture, in which case all would have been discovered, and our lives would, no doubt, have been instantly sacrificed. Our good fortune prevailed, however, and although he frequently touched it as the vessel rolled, he never pressed against it sufficiently to bring about a discovery. The bottom of the jacket had been carefully fastened to the bulkhead, so that the hole might not be seen by its swinging to one side. All this time, Tiger was laying in the foot of the berth, and appeared to have recovered in some measure his faculties, for I could see him occasionally open his eyes and draw a long breath. After a few minutes, the mate and cook went above, leaving Dirk Peters behind, who, as soon as they were gone, came and set himself down in the place just occupied by the mate. He began to talk very sociably with Augustus, and we could now see that the greater part of his apparent intoxication, while the two others were with him, was a feint. He answered all my companions' questions with perfect freedom, told him that he had no doubt of his father's having been picked up, and there were no less than five cell in sight just before sundown on the day he was cut adrift, and used other language of a consolatory nature which occasioned me with no less surprise than pleasure. Indeed, I began to entertain hopes that through the instrumentality of Peters we might be finally enabled to regain possession of the brig, and this idea I mentioned to Augustus as soon as I found an opportunity. He thought the matter possible, but urged the necessity of the greatest caution in making the attempt, as the conduct of the hybrid appeared to be instigated by the most arbitrary caprice alone and indeed it was difficult to say if he was at any moment of sound mind. Peters went upon deck in about an hour, and did not return again until noon, when he brought Augustus a plentiful supply of junk beef and pudding. Of this when we were alone, I partook heartily, without returning through the hole. No one else came down into the forecastle during the day, and at night I got into Augustus' berth, where I slept soundly and sweetly until nearly daybreak, when he awakened me upon hearing a stir upon deck, and I regained my hiding place as quickly as possible. When the day was fully broke, we found that Tiger had recovered his strength almost entirely, and gave no indications of hydrophobia, drinking a little water that was offered him with great apparent eagerness. During the day he regained all his former vigor and appetite, his strange conduct had been brought on, no doubt, by the deleterious quality of the air of the hold, and had no connection with canine madness. I could not sufficiently rejoice that I had persisted in bringing him with me from the box. This day was the 13th of June, and the 13th since the Grampus made sail from Nantucket. On the 2nd of July the mate came below, drunk as usual, and in an excessively good humor. He came to Augustus' berth, and, giving him a slap on the back, asked him if he thought he could behave himself if he let him loose, and whether he would promise not to be going into the cabin again. To this, of course, my friend answered in the affirmative, when the ruffian set him at liberty, after making him drink from a flask of rum which he drew from his coat pocket. Bolt now went on deck, and I did not see Augustus for about three hours. He then came below with the good news that he had obtained permission to go about the brig as he pleased, anywhere forward of the main mast, and that he had been ordered to sleep, as usual, in the forecastle. He brought me, too, a good dinner, and a plentiful supply of water. The brig was still cruising for the vessel from the Cape Verdes, and a sail was now in sight, which was thought to be the one in question. As the events of the ensuing eight days were of little importance, and had no direct bearing upon the main incidents of my narrative, I will here throw them into the form of a journal, as I do not wish to omit them altogether. July 3rd. 
Augustus furnished me with three blankets, with which I contrived a comfortable bed in my hiding place. No one came below except my companion during the day. Tiger took his station in the berth just by the aperture and slept heavily, as if not yet entirely recovered from the effects of his sickness. Toward night, a flaw of wind struck the brig before sail could be taken in, and very nearly capsized her. The puff died away immediately, however, and no damage was done beyond the splitting of the foretop sail. Dirk Peters treated Augustus all this day with great kindness, and entered into a long conversation with him respecting the Pacific Ocean and the islands he had visited in that region. He asked him whether he would not like to go with the mutineers on a kind of exploring and pleasure voyage in those quarters, and said that the men were gradually coming over to the mate's views. To this Augustus thought it best to reply that he would be glad to go on such an adventure, since nothing better could be done, and that anything was preferable to a piratical life. July 4th The vessel in sight proved to be a small brig from Liverpool, and was allowed to pass unmolested. Augustus spent most of his time on deck, with a view of obtaining all the information in his power respecting the intentions of the mutineers. They had frequent and violent quarrels among themselves, in one of which a harpooner, Jim Bonner, was thrown overboard. The party of the mate was gaining ground. Jim Bonner belonged to the Cook's Gang, of which Peters was a partisan. July 5th About daybreak there came a stiff breeze from the west, which at noon freshened into a gale, so that the brig could carry nothing more than her trysail and foresail. And taking in the foretopsail, Sims, one of the common hands, and belonged also to the cook's gang, fell overboard, being very much in liquor, and was drowned, no attempt being made to save him. The whole number of persons on board was now thirteen, to wit, Dirk Peters, Seymour, the black cook, Jones, Greeley, Hartman Rogers, and William Allen, all of the cook's party. The mate, whose name I never learned, Absalom Hicks, Wilson, John Hunty Richard Parker, of the mate's party, besides Augustus and myself. July 6. The gale lasted all this day, blowing in heavy squalls accompanied with rain. The brig took in a good deal of water through her seams, and one of the pumps was kept continually going, Augustus being forced to take his turn. Just at twilight a large ship passed close by us, without having been discovered until within hail. The ship was supposed to be the one for which the mutineers were on the lookout. The mate hailed her, but the reply was drowned in the roaring of the gale. At eleven, a sea was shipped amidships which tore away a great portion of the larboard bulwarks, and did some other slight damage. Toward morning the weather moderated, and at sunrise there was very little wind. July 7th There was a heavy swell running all this day, during which the brig, being light, rolled excessively, and many articles broke loose in the hold, as I could hear distinctly from my hiding place. I suffered a great deal from seasickness. Peters had a long conversation this day with Augustus, and told him that two of his gang, Greeley and Allen, had gone over to the mate and were resolved to turn pirates. He put several questions to Augustus which he did not then exactly understand. During a part of this evening the leak gained upon the vessel, and little could be done to remedy it, as it was occasioned by the brig straining and taking in the water through her seams. A sail was thrummed, and got under the bows, which aided us in some measure, so that we began to gain upon the leak. July 8th. A light breeze sprang up at sunrise from the eastward, when the mate headed the brig to the southwest, with the intention of making some of the West India Islands in pursuance of his piratical designs. No opposition was made by Peters or the cook, at least none in the hearing of Augustus. All ideas of taking the vessel from the Cape Verdes was abandoned. The leak was now easily kept under by one pump going every three quarters of an hour. The sail was drawn from beneath the bows, spoke two small schooners during the day. July 9th. Fine weather. All hands employed in repairing bulwarks. Peters had again a long conversation with Augustus, 
and spoke more plainly than he had done heretofore. He said nothing should induce him to come into the mate's views, and even hinted his intention of taking the brig out of his hands. He asked my friend if he could depend upon his aid in such case, to which Augustus said, Yes, without hesitation. Peters then said he would sound the others of his party upon the subject and went away. During the remainder of the day, Augustus had no opportunity of speaking with him privately.